Hello, everyone. Today we are going to look at chapter one, the science of biology. What is biology? Biology, by definition, is the scientific study of life. So what then is life? Properties of life include cellular organization, reproduction, growth and development, energy processing or metabolism, regulation, the attempt to maintain homeostasis, responsiveness, responding to our environment, and evolutionary adaptation. These properties are all properties that are coming amongst all living things. No matter how different or diverse these life forms are, these properties or characteristics must be met in order to be considered a life form. So throughout this chapter, we're going to elaborate on these properties that help us to define life. Biology is the scientific study of life. And at the core of this is the uh, fact that all living things are made up of cells, okay? So we refer to the cell as the structural and functional unit of life. All living things, no matter how different from one another that they are, they're going to share this core set of characteristics or properties. Cellular organization, reproduction, and remember this reproduction can be um, different forms of reproduction, sexual and asexual reproduction. Um, there's going to be some degree of growth and development throughout the organism's lifespan. The uh, metabolic activity all living things are going to require uh, energy, all right? We're gonna look at how various organisms obtain and utilize energy, okay? So metabolic activity, regulation, all living things must acquire, must, must have a built-in mechanism for um, maintaining homeostasis, okay? This attempt to um, maintain this constant internal environment, sort of a, a stable uh, equilibrium, okay? All living things must have mechanisms in place for this to occur, okay? Responsiveness, again, all living things must have the ability to respond to a particular stimulus. And again, depending on the actual organism, this responsiveness may look a little different. Typically, the responsiveness will be in the form of a movement, okay? Responding to a source of stimuli in the external environment. All living things are going to have this uh, capability. And then evolutionary adaptation is referring to the fact that all living things are going to acquire mutations or changes in our DNA over time, right? These are inherited changes from parent to offspring, okay? And these changes in our DNA, these mutations are essentially providing survival advantages to the next generation. And so what we see then is an evolutionary uh, advantage for survival. So this adaptation is, is happening um, as a result of these inherited uh, mutations, all right? So here I have some representative images that's reiterating this notion that all living things are gonna share this common set of characteristics. Cellular organization, if you think back to uh, the uh, cell theory, we understand that all living things are made up of cells. There are, the cell is the most basic and fundamental unit of life, and that all cells arise from pre-existing cells. So again, depending on the actual organism, there's going to be some level of cellular organization, okay? We'll talk further about the distinction between an organism being a unicellular organism or a multicellular organism, right? Our uh, unicellular organisms are going to be our simple um, single-celled organisms like our bacteria or yeast. And by definition, these single-celled organisms are going to have the ability to um, carry out all of these essential functions for life that we'll continue to um, identify, right? And then um, we also have multicellular organisms. And these are going to be our larger, more complex 
uh, eukaryotic organisms, all right? So cellular organization is at the base, at the foundation of life, all right? Reproduction, again, we're understanding here that reproduction is a requirement in order to continue to perpetuate a species, right? In the absence of reproduction amongst a species, we will um, experience extinction of that species. And so this requirement for life, I want you to understand is not that every member of the species have to reproduce, but we're saying that some members of the species must continue to reproduce and create offsprings in order to continue to perpetuate the existence of this species. And so therefore reproduction is in fact a requirement or a property um, or characteristic of life. Growth and development, all right? We highlighted growth and development as a, a major requirement for life. All organisms will experience some level of growth and development throughout its lifespan, okay? If you think about the human, at, at the earliest form of conception, you've got the zygote, right? You've got a fertilized egg, all right? That begins the existence of this new individual, okay? And over the next several months, this uh, fertilized egg will continue to develop. Okay, it will develop into an embryo, and then it will develop into a fetus, and then we'll go on and have this live birth that will continue to develop. Growth and development will continue to happen throughout the lifespan of this individual from an infant to a toddler to a um, child to an adolescent on into an adult. And so we have these varying degrees of growth and development amongst humans. And so this is also true for many of the other diverse life forms that exist. There are um, life cycles of growth and development amongst various organisms, okay? Energy processing. We cannot underscore the importance of uh, understanding the role of energy in sustaining life, okay? All of these properties and characteristics that we are identifying as a requirement for life are going to require a source of energy, okay? So organisms must have the ability to obtain and utilize energy, okay? This energy is necessary in order to fuel life's processes, okay? And so we'll talk later about some of the uh, energy producing pathways. Um, responsiveness, right? We're saying that living things must have the propensity to um, be responsive, responding to sources of stimuli in the environment, okay? Regulation, again, we're understanding that we must be able to uh, maintain homeostasis, all right? Keep things at a nice and happy, um, stable, steady state. At an, at an equilibrium, okay? And then the notion of uh, evolutionary adaptation. Again, we're inheriting the um, changes in our DNA, these mutations that we are inheriting from one generation to the next that will ultimately provide uh, these survival advantages for us. Okay, and so we see this evolutionary adaptation, we see these processes like natural selection taking place, and we are being equipped with what we need to continue to survive as best we can. And so we understand that the, the, the study of life, again, looks at this organization, okay? So we have a checkpoint question. If you were asked, what is life? How would you define life? Take a few moments and respond to this question. How would you define life? Now that we have identified necessary properties, how would you then now respond to this question, how do you define life? We have identified some key features of life.
okay? So we're aware that life exists across many different diverse organisms, okay? Biologists arrange the diversity of life into three different domains, right? So taxonomists are those scientists that are, that are um, responsible for the naming and classification of the various uh, organisms that exist. And so all of the organisms that we have um, properly identified to date can be categorized into one of the three domains of life. Although there is a debate, there is a consensus amongst the biologists that yes, we can uh, assign all of the organisms that we've identified into one of the three domains of life, all right? Domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. These are the three domains of life that you should be familiar with. Okay, this is the broadest, most general level of classification. Domains bacteria and archaea contains our uh, organisms that are uh, simple, single-celled organisms. These are our prokaryotic organisms in this domain. Okay, on the other hand, domain eukarya includes all of the other uh, kingdoms, th which are the protists, the fungi, plants, and animals, okay? So from a point of classification, I want you to be able to uh, identify the three domains of life and the five kingdoms of classification, okay? Domain bacteria, archaea, eukarya, okay? Domains, bacteria, and archaea, these are our prokaryotic domains. Prokaryotic organisms are going to be these bacteriums that do not contain a nucleus, okay? Domain eukarya, these are the other four kingdoms, protist, fungi, plantae, and animaliae, okay? These are all eukaryotic organisms. They contain both uh, unicellular and multicellular organisms, okay? And so you should be familiar with the domains and kingdoms and the types of organisms that fall into each of these uh, delineations. So, here are some um, images to just uh, reiterate the um, classification of organisms and the domains for which they are assigned. So domain bacteria, this is a prokaryotic organism. Bacteria are prokaryotic. Domain archaea, so archaea are also uh, prokaryotic single-celled organisms, but they, they are in a domain all of their own and not with bacteria because they share some very unique properties that allows them to um, be classified a little bit uh, different than bacteria, okay? Archaea are single cell prokaryotes, but they have a very complex or extreme living uh, conditions that makes them a little bit different than normal bacteria. They can survive in very extreme environments that typically would not be conducive for um, the average uh, bacterium to survive, okay? And so we have a domain archaea all by itself. We have domain bacteria, and then we have domain eukarya, which are gonna contain our other four uh, kingdoms, okay? So our protist, this is where we're going to find our um, organisms like um, protozoan organisms and other parasites. Uh, we have kingdom plantae where we've got various, you know, plants and so forth. Kingdom animalies where we're going to have our higher order plant uh, animals, excuse me. And then we've got uh, kingdom fungi. This is where we're going to find our yeast and mold and mushrooms and organisms uh, of that nature, okay? And so these organisms then can all 
be classified into one of the five kingdoms. So we've got bacteria. This is our um, kingdom Monera. We've got archaea here. It's a type of bacterium, but it's a little bit different based on um, genetic analysis and structural differences. Um, the new, uh, growth requirements for archaea sets them apart from um, traditional bacteria cells. Our protist, again, this is where we're going to have many different organisms, such as, again, our protozoan parasites and so forth. Kingdom plantae, we've got our plants and the, uh, trees and grass and different types of organisms. Uh, kingdom fungi, we're going to have our fungus, our moles, yeast, which are our unicellular organisms and then we have these fungi and mushrooms which are going to be our multicellular organisms and then kingdom animalia where we've got a very broad spectrum of organisms that are a part of this kingdom and so we come upon another checkpoint question as we're talking about this uh concept of taxonomy and classification and naming or arranging uh the diverse life forms into kingdoms to which of the three domains of life do we belong? In your notebook, to which of the three domains of life do we as human beings belong? Okay. So as I mentioned, as I mentioned before, the cell is the most basic uh a unit of life, right? And so these cells can then be further organized into more complex structures. And we end up with this hierarchy, okay? So life's hierarchy leads us into a conversation about biological organization. And so we study life in regards to uh, various levels of organization. And we can study this from, a, from an organism standpoint as well as from an ecological standpoint, okay? And so in life's hierarchy of organization, new properties continue to emerge at each new level, okay? And so we're saying here that we can study life across a very broad range of scales from molecules in a cell into an entire um, planet. All right, so we'll look then at some of the levels of uh, biological organization. Uh, from an organism standpoint, if we start over here at the cell, we can understand that these cells can be organized into tissues. These tissues can arrange themselves into organs with very specific functions. These organs can function together as an entire organ system. And then this organ system is what how we create an entire organism. These are levels of biological organization as far as the organism is concerned. However, we can also study life from an ecological perspective where now we're taking into account the role of our environment, okay? We understand that organisms cannot exist independent of their environment. So we have to take into account the role that our environment around us, the role that it plays in sustaining life um, and the diversity of life, right? And so from an ecological perspective, we can study the levels of organization from the individual or the organism. We can study life in the context of a population, which is when we have multiple um, organisms of the same species for which we study. We can also uh, study life from the um, uh, community level where we have uh, many different populations occupying the same area, all right? We can study life from the community level. And then we also can study life from the uh, perspective of the ecosystem, okay? And so the ecosystem is a, is a very unique uh, level uh, where these emergent properties now are taken into account 
um, abiotic factors, okay? And so up until this level, we were studying life as it relates to biotic factors, these living factors. Um, at the level of the ecosystem, now we are interested in both the uh, biotic and abiotic factors that will influence or have an impact on our life. And so examples of, bi of abiotic factors or non-living factors are going to include things like um, the climate or temperature, the sunlight, the water, the soil. These are all non-living factors that do have an impact on our lives, right? We've mentioned before um, that living things, uh, heterotrophic organisms in particular, those that are unable to produce their own foods, have a uh, this this dependency there's this interdependent relationship between organisms and the environment so a lot of the um factors that help to sustain us as living things are provided from our environment okay understanding th uh that the sun is the major source of energy but the consumption of food and oxygen that we breathe and water that we need. These are all abiotic factors that are provided for us from the environment. And so we study ecosystems, right? There are many different types of ecosystems depending on where we are. These ecosystems are all inhabited by uh, different organisms. Again, depending on where we are, the climate, so forth. We've got you know aquatic ecosystems. We've got terrestrial ecosystems that are all again gonna be inhabited by different um, life forms, okay? And so then we, and, and then the broadest level of, um, for which we can study or study characteristics or properties of life are going to be at the level of the biosphere, okay? And so I want you to take a moment to um, appreciate these levels of organization, okay? This hierarchy that exists for which we are able to uh, study life. <clears throat> and at each level, again, we're seeing this idea that new um properties emerge at each level of organization okay and so we have a checkpoint question here okay we're saying that in life's hierarchy of organization new properties emerge at each level so i'll ask the question which of these levels of biological organization includes all of the others in the list okay so we've got the cell molecules organs and tissue which of these includes all of the others? Take a moment and answer that in your notebook. Okay. So next we'll shift our conversation into the process of science, right? So we're understanding that uh, biology is a science, but what is science? What is science, okay? Science can be thought of as a, uh, a process or a way of thinking, an approach, okay? We will define science as a way of knowing. It is a tool or a pathway or an approach to understanding the natural world around us, okay? And so science as a tool uses an evidence-based process of inquiry in order to investigate the natural world. This scientific approach involves observations, hypotheses, predictions, testing of hypotheses via experiments or additional observations and the analysis of data, okay? And so we have this process that we know as the scientific method as a systematic approach for investigating what's going on around us and answering questions, okay? A scientific theory then is 
uh, can be derived as a result of uh, scientific inquiry. Okay, so this theory then is a broad uh, idea that has been supported by a large body of evidence. Okay, so a lot of the laws and theories that we hold to be true were derived from scientific inquiry done systematically. It has to be um, repetitive, okay? We do this, we follow this method in order to have a, a reproducible uh, set of results, okay? And so we know that we have scientists all across the globe that are investigating and exploring, answering questions, inquiring minds. And so in order for us to have reliable results such that we can derive these laws and theories, we've got to have a systematic a way of approaching and trying to problem solve. And that is what we use the scientific method for, okay? So the scientific method, how does it work? We start with some question that is usually due to an observation, okay? So for example, this flashlight doesn't work. That's our primary observation here in this example. So we made an observation that this flashlight doesn't work. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna pose a question and try and figure out why is this flashlight not working, okay? So we can formulate some hypotheses. What is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is going to be a prediction based on prior knowledge and observations, okay? So the first hypothesis for why this flash not, flashlight is not working uh, it could be due to the fact that the batteries are dead, okay? That's hypothesis number one. The next hypothesis is that perhaps this bulb is blown out, okay? Both of these hypotheses creates an opportunity for testing, okay? This prediction is that replacing our batteries will fix the problem. We will then set up an experiment that allows us to test this prediction. So one of the most important features of a hypothesis is that it must be testable, okay? So we made an observation, this flashlight's not working. We asked the question, why doesn't this flashlight work? We formulated two hypotheses these, both of these hypotheses are uh, those that can be tested, okay? So the first prediction is that if we replace the batteries, this will fix the problem and the flashlight will work, okay? So now we set up a set of experiments or investigations that's gonna allow us to test this prediction. We're gonna replace the batteries in this flashlight, okay? And then we will get some results. The flashlight still doesn't work which means that our hypothesis is not supported in this case, okay? So now we might go on and test hypothesis number two, that perhaps the bulb of this flashlight has burned out. We have a prediction that can be tested. We're gonna replace the bulb and see if this fixes the flashlight. We test this, we experiment, we replace the bulb in this flashlight, and what do you know? The flashlight works. Therefore, this hypothesis is supported. And so we're making the point here that when we make observations and formulate questions and have a, an inquiry that we want to explore, we have to go about it in a very systematic manner, okay? We cannot do this in a way to which our results cannot be repeated. Okay, so when we're talking about science, we're understanding that science is a process or a pathway for discovering new things, all right? We do this with scientific inquiry using the scientific method, 
a systematic manner for answering questions and solving problems. So checkpoint question, based on what we just talked about, what is the main requirement for a scientific hypothesis? In your notes, what is the main requirement for a scientific hypothesis? Okay, so your answer should have included a discussion of how a hypothesis needs to be testable, okay? Hypotheses can be tested using controlled experiments, okay? In an experimental test of a hypothesis, researchers often manipulate one component, and this is important. We're manipulating one component at a time in order to observe the effects of this change, okay? The factor that is being manipulated is our independent variable, okay? The measure that's used to judge the outcome of the experiment is called our dependable variable, right? So changes in the independent variable will allow us to measure or determine um, the outcome is as the dependent variable, okay? This variable depends on the manipulated variable. So we will have to observe the outcome. And so we, what we end up with is what we call a controlled experiment that we've set up now, right? Where we can compare an experimental group with a control group, okay? It is important that you understand when we set up an ex a controlled experiment, we've got to have a control. Our control group is the group that will not be altered. This is going to be our point of comparison here, okay? After we've done the manipulations of our variables and we've conducted this experiment, we've got to have a, 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 a baseline point of comparison in order to compare what may have changed. Okay, so we do controlled experiments in science in order to investigate and answer questions. So the use of a control and an experimental group can demonstrate the effects of a single variable. Okay, so I have an example. Researchers found that mice models that did not match their habitat had higher predation rates than camouflaged models. So think about this. Mice models that are in a particular habitat, these mouse models did not match the habitat for which they were in. They were preyed upon more. They had higher rates of predation than those mice that were camouflaged, okay? That makes sense, right? So we can form a hypothesis that can be tested to see this phenomenon, okay? Hypotheses can be tested in humans with clinical trials, as well as retrospective or pros prospective observational studies. We can test our hypotheses, okay? So there are many different ways that we can design a study in order to test our hypotheses, okay? So for the example with the mice model, we said that mice that, mouse models that did not um, match their environment were preyed upon more, okay? So the results from this experiment, we can see the number of, ta uh, the number of attacks in comparison to the habitat, okay? So in the beach habitat where there's a light habitat, the number of attacks on camouflaged um, models was two compared to the number of uh, non-camouflaged models, there were uh, five, okay? So the percentage of attacks on non-camouflaged models was about 71% on the beach habitat. On the inland, with the darker habitat, uh, the number of attacks on uh, camouflage models was five, 
whereas the number of attacks on non-camouflage models were 16. So we had a total percentage of attacks on these non-camouflage models at 76%, okay? So we can set up an experiment to test our observations and hypotheses that have been formulated, okay? So we set up what we call controlled experiments to test hypotheses, okay? So another checkpoint question in your notebook. In some studies, researchers try to match factors such as sex, age, general health for subjects in control and experimental groups. What is the experimental design trying to do? What are we attempting to do as we're outsourcing uh, and trying to uh, match factors across all of our subjects in this study? We're trying to match factors like the age, making sure everyone's around the same age, everyone's the same sex, everyone has the um, same uh, general health, okay? What are we attempting to do when we design an experiment with these goals in mind? What are we attempting to do here? Okay, jot that down in your notebook. So, what we end up with is this um, sort of circle of, of inquiry that continues to lead us back. So we formulate and test our hypotheses. We start with some type of exploration or discovery that leads to questions that allows us to formulate hypotheses. We've got some type of feedback from a scientific community that leads us to you know, adjust our hypotheses or continue uh, testing our hypotheses. We think about societal benefits or outcomes from a particular issue. This again may influence what we form as a hypothesis for a particular uh, question or observation or inquiry. And this can continue to be changed, okay? And adjusted based on new information, new feedback, new benefits, okay? We can continue to evolve. Okay, and so we're understanding here then that the process of science, it's not static. It certainly should be one that is repetitive, reproducible. We're understanding that this is nonlinear. Okay, many factors can affect it. It is collaborative. And so we have a question. Why is hypothesis testing at the center of the process of science, okay? We defined science as a process. Why is hypothesis testing at the center of the process of science? Why? Why is this hypothesis testing so important in this process? stop here for now. <laughs>